Welcome back, everybody. SF Live episode 222. I love it. 222. And uh, we'll be joined here in a few short seconds by John Finnick of Finnick Consulting. John is a regular here on the program. We've had him, but I think it was last in June. Feels like yesterday. Time has just been flying. So it's great to catch up with him. A lot has happened in the market. So, uh, of course, we're going to go look back and make, uh, you know, make us sound very, very smart. But uh, we're also going to take a closer look at what is happening right now, recent gold price action, silver price action, and of course, like what can we look forward to or should avoid in the next few days here or in trading or to the end of the year, actually. It's Thanksgiving, U.S. Thanksgiving tomorrow. So the, the year is about to wrap up here. It's almost done. So we're going to talk with John on how to position yourself even for the new year, maybe some of, uh, some of the ideas he has and uh, some investment ideas he has as well. So we're going to catch up on that. Before we do that, before I switch over to my guest real quick, uh, be reminded to follow us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, hit the like and subscribe button for more great content. Uh, hit the bell icon as well as we do most of our interviews live these days. Uh, that way you get a little push notification as well and you can join us live and join the discussion here on YouTube or on Twitter as well and uh, follow us there. Uh, be, mean, it means a lot to us and uh, of course we want to see some engagement. Really appreciate that. Of course, enough of me now. Let me switch over to my guest. Let me switch over to Mr. John Finneck. John, it's great to see you. Uh, okay. How you been doing? How was the rest of your summer? And like lots happened. How have you been holding up? Yeah, so we last saw each other at uh, Precious Metal Summit in September, and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be invited onto one of the interviews there with David Lynn and had a great time, um, met with 20 plus companies. You know, one of the things I said on my September 10th uh, Lynn piece was it was shocking to me that there weren't more financial advisors in, in attendance. You know, I think there were two registered FAs uh, in the entire conference which if that's not an indication of a bell ringing that we're near a low, right? Um, and then September 10th was near the near-term low, which I think was created, you know, in early October in the mining stocks. So when you get this kind of herd mentality moving towards whether it's tech or just trying to keep up with the S&P or the QQQ, it's, it's dangerous to chase that kind of thing, you know? Um, I don't know about you, Kai, but there's a lot of my friends coming to me now and asking me about stocks that have never invested in the stock market. And like, that's exactly what happened to me in 99 with tech. It's like all these people approached me and said, what do you think about this, this, and this? I'm like, this guy has no interest or previous interest in investing. It's, it's interesting now that all of a sudden, you know, people are, are really um, getting excited about putting money to market at all time highs. So it's dangerous. And I think, um, you know, you know my background. I worked with financial advisors for 27 of my 29 years, and they um, are the type of people that um, you know, uh, portfolio managers, FAs. They're 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 going to try to keep up with the indexes, right? Whether that's through model portfolios or through just as a PM, you're you're benching against the SPY, the S&P. You have to beat that S&P index in order to get bonus on December 31st. <laughs> that's something I've said, you know, since August on podcasts like this. And it's played out true. I mean, it's it's like every time we get a dip in the broad market, it gets bought. And why do you think that is? Well, I mean, the, the, the names that are continuing to lead the market higher keep raging higher. So these guys and women have to continue to buy beta and buy risk. And that is going to unravel. And you're starting to see that unravel right now with certain names that have been, you know, Wall Street favorites here uh, during the pandemic, like Zoom and Peloton and stuff. I mean, these charts look disgusting. <laughs> That's yeah, dis disgusting is uh, is putting it very very politely. Uh, you could have made a handsome a handsome coin actually, just betting on buying puts just before Peloton numbers, Zoom numbers came out. Uh, just just buying those puts, like stocks were pummeled. Like I think Zoom was down thirty percent at some point right after the numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. Peloton thirty five percent. So yeah, with some decent puts, you could have made some decent coin actually, just playing those markets. Uh, no, no need to actually play gold and silver. Just buy puts on the uh, on the COVID stocks. I call them right, like the home economy or like what do you call that? The home economy. Yeah, like staying at home economy stocks. Right. So would have been really interesting. Um, I want to talk about like since, since you talked about the broader uh, issues at hand. Like one of the reasons that I, I think the the big dips are being bought is of all the cheap money out there as well. So you don't have to worry about it. It's easy to buy stocks and put your money into stocks right now. Um, inf inflation has been a really really big topic at our Deutsche Goldmesse uh, about ten days ago. Uh, almost every single keynote speaker addressed it. We've got a lot of questions from the audience. Um, how, how is that framing everything, and how does it fit into your investment narrative? So, you know, we've been talking for months now about CPI being not transitory, uh, as the Fed has said. And if you look at the Fed messaging, 
out of nowhere, October 22nd, Powell just said on a Friday, hey, uh, by the way, um, yeah, we think CPI is going to rage higher until June 30th, roughly of next year. So that was interesting. And it caused a brief disruption intraday uh, that day. Uh, that was followed by the Fed meeting in November, where they said, mm, we changed our mind. And now it's going to be probably Q3, meaning up until September 30th of next year. So the Fed is now finally acknowledging that CPI is not transitory in our view. And that is interesting. Um, we're not seeing it really go down to the bottom line, though, for gold and silver investors yet. And that's frustrating. Um, but over time, I think this is just a problem that they're going to have to cope with. And um, how, they, how do they deal with that? They have one tool. It's raise interest rates, right? And if you look at the Fed watch tool, as we sit here right now, it's about a 50% probability that you're going to have a Fed rate hike in June of next year, which is seven months away, which I think would be very destructive to the current uh, broad market. So I am not in that camp that we're going to see that hike. Um, I think it would be later in the year next year, that first rate hike up, and it'll be small. It'll be a quarter point. So, you know, I, go ahead, Kai, I'm sorry. No, just a cu couple of themes playing along that as well. And uh, one topic that popped up, it was, it was quite interesting, is like mortgage rates uh, as well, or the, the mortgage lending uh, from, from that aspect. Is that an indicator for you as well to see a, maybe a looming crash coming? Well, I've been wrong on the real estate call. I thought we top, we would top out in early part of this year. You know, I, I saw the uh, let's get out of our homes, you know, kind of movement and, and let's redo our homes. Obviously, everyone saw that last March to end of last year, right? You know, we saw lumber prices spike. We saw a lot of home improvement stocks do well. Uh, this year coming up will be a more challenging year for real estate, but I don't think the party's over just yet. Um, and I say that because I'm living in, in Maricopa County here in Arizona, which is the hottest county, I think, for growth in the last decade so in the U.S. So it is just like cranes everywhere, construction everywhere. It, it gets, to, you get, you know, as you drive around, you get the feeling that you're getting close to a bubble, but you're not there yet. Um, and I don't see the, the home numbers really crashing anything, you know, like significantly yet. So I think you're going to continue to see real estate do okay. Um, the one thing that does worry me is that, as you know, you know, the, the landlords have had no power through COVID at all to evict anyone. That started to change uh, just recently here in the U.S. And I think that as of Jan 1, it'll change in a lot of states. Um, and so we could see a wave of evictions um, as, as landlords just get tired of dealing with tenants not paying and then they go and sell their home, right? Like there's going to be a lot of new inventory possibly on the market next year. We'll see. That should be interesting. Yeah, lots of new inventory usually crunches prices. One, one, one thing is just staying on that mortgage theme for just one second is uh, Zillow dumping or closing part of their business where they were flipping houses and now they're selling them at a loss. Like, is that an indicator for you for something bigger looming? You know, honestly, I didn't even see that. That's interesting. Um, I would say that that's uh, not a good sign at all. Uh, I mean, you know, this is this is. Um, Hmm. I'll have to take, take a look at yeah. that. Kind yeah, of go, go check it out. Like they, they, were, they had a business, uh, a subsidiary or so that was flipping houses and they closed yeah. that one down and they had to sell over a thousand houses at a massive loss. So hmm. just to get out of it, right? So quite interesting yeah. um, as, a, as a theme, like those are some of the black swan events I'm looking for, like maybe some indicators like of something bigger looming as well. If they say, hey, well, this is not worth it for us. Um, and then they start, like I, I saw a Twitter post, somebody sold a house to them for five hundred fifty thousand dollars. Two weeks later, he got a, a call back, said, "Hey, do you want to buy it back?" And he said, "Yeah, I'll give you three fifty And they said, "Yes," on the spot. So wow. that was really interesting. Like those are the the, the things yeah. I look for when I'm on Twitter, for example. Like those little like tidbits that mm -hmm. could show an indication of what, where things are headed. Um, you you, you mentioned uh, the, the Fed, of course, and inflation and transitory and all those things. Well, we've seen the big CPI number come out: six point one, six point two percent. Um, in, in the US that actually gave a big boost to gold prices because it seems like the journalists understood, okay, this is not transitory anymore, like you said, and uh, th there's more happening in the background and 6.2% is a significant number. I might have to hedge. I might have to do something. And gold started to rally. We've seen three great weeks. Was that just a head fake? Because right now I'm just looking at it. We're at 1785. We're down again, a hundred bucks. Um, what, what is happening? So we watched that very closely too. And the previous two high CPI reads were met with initial selling, if you remember, pre-market. This time it lasted about two minutes. So the shorts came in, tried to lower prices and they couldn't. And then gold spiked really hard after that 6.1 or 6.2 read. So that was a very positive thing, I think, is that the final, finally the big money either came in or the shorts just ran for it. You know, it, it was 
um, a, a different type of price action. But to your point, um, you know, now you have this couple week rally and then, you know, we have the Fed news uh, that Biden, you know, reelects Powell on, on Monday, the 22nd and gold tanks again and, and it breaks through 1800, the 23rd like butter. So, you know, really frustrating um, as a gold investor, as I've said many times on your program, we, we don't own any gold at this point. Um, I see the reasoning behind owning gold, but I'm much more interested in bottom fishing gold equities right now because the gold price is still relatively good you know it's like when you look at history prices are still very good so like whether it's a producing company or an exploration company we're very interested in owning the equities here as people are tax loss selling and, and somewhat panic selling yeah tax loss selling is the next big topic i wanted to talk with you about um because it seems like that big of a let's call it a gold price rally we've seen a bit there is a bit positive momentum um, seems like it put a damper on tax loss season, which is actually positive. I make it sound like it's a negative, but I'm happy that tax loss season at least hasn't really started yet. But I'm really curious to get your views on it. Like, where are we in the tax loss season? Have we seen it already? Are we in the middle of it? Hasn't even has it even started? I think it has started. Uh, and, and some of the names that we own and monitor, um, you know, it's I'm seeing that in. in um, some of the palladium stocks. Uh, I've talked to three palladium CEOs in the last week or so, and none of them can understand why their pressure is there. It's not a warrant overhang. There's no negative news. They're just getting crushed, you know, and 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 um, palladium itself has not been very good, as, as you know. I mean, PALL is the tracker there, and you're right around that support level of, you know, 170 to 172 right now, uh, which is not great. Uh, so, you know, you expect some selling in those equities, but some of them have really been sold off. Uh, Canadian Palladium comes to mind. Clean Air Metals comes to mind. Um, I think both of those companies will have news coming up, whether it's the next month or two or three, and you know, investors will then buy it back, right? It's like, so you know how it works, Kai. People, people take a tax loss, they have to wait 30 days to buy it back. And, and so maybe you see some selling here late November, buy it back early January, what have you. Um, but I, I, I've always been in the camp and, and, and differ from some of your guests in that tax loss selling is always here. It's always going to be an issue. It's just how much of an issue and it's impossible to tell until it's upon you. So you, know, you have to monitor things closely and how we work for that, just so your clients and, and listeners understand, is we instruct our followers and our alert clients to bottom, bottom fish via um, st stink bids. You know, one of your guests, Dave Earthley, taught me this many years ago, how to, how to play stink bids on junior mining stocks just put the put the bid 10 to 15 percent away from the action and just see what happens you know you'll get you'll get some days like this where it's really thin leading up to thanksgiving or the day between thanksgiving and the weekend um there's not gonna be a lot of people at their desks so if you do have a seller out there they're selling into very few bids uh, no that's a really good strategy and uh putting those stink bids in especially around this time of year tax loss season thanksgiving holidays people are mentally wrapping up for the year as well and cleaning their books um in, in another interview like i think you made a comment about actually funds fund managers it's bonus season right and i think you might have mentioned it earlier as well like bonus season how does that play into where, where are we at right now um what are the fund managers chasing right now or what are they trying to get rid of to, to make them look uh, make themselves look better yeah, so the concept of making yourself look better, if you will, is known as window dressing in portfolio management. And um, that will occur between now and December 31st. I don't know how they're going to position. No one does. But I would say that uh, if we see these kind of momentum stocks we mentioned continue to sell off, they're going to divest of those and buy the Pfizer's of the world, the Exxon's of the world, the stuff that's you know more large cap and, and broader more broader acceptance right uh and to, to look a different way uh because a lot of these uh portfolio managers have been doing just the opposite of that they're buying tesla zoom whatever all year and then dumping it you know when they see all these big trades coming in here leading up to the end of the year so i i would say that the average portfolio manager right now is faced with a conundrum it's like how do i beat the s p the nasdaq whatever i'm benched against and they have to do that in order to get their year end bonus. And I just think it's a matter of greed. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to single out any PM, but it's like, what about doing the right thing for your clients? You know, it's like if you if you are out there just just worried about making your bonus, um, is that really uh, the best, you know, um, methodology for your shareholders? I, the answer is clearly no. And so, you know, I think you're going to get a sell off in Q1. I don't know what's what magnitude. 
But I would say a healthy correction would be 10 to 12% in some of these indexes, you know, because the pressure is then off the PM. They don't have to, um, you know, feel like pressure to beat that, that, that bonus until, you know, the end of uh, 2022. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm with you there on that thesis. It's, it, it's the market is right for a sell off regardless, but as long as the cheap money continues pouring in, it'll, it'll be difficult to see. But those home economy stocks, like the COVID stocks, I'm pretty sure are going to be hit a little more because people are going back to work and all that. So I don't think, it's like I've been hearing from people that own a Peloton bike, they haven't used it in six months. So uh, I'm sure there's a theme there, right? Um, right. Uh, talking themes, investment themes. Uh, we talked to gold, silver a little bit, uh, but what are some of the other themes you're, you're seeing out in the market right now? Uh, maybe also in, in, in conjunction with the, the infrastructure bill as well. Like oil has been a big topic, uh, like the US thinking about releasing some of their own reserves to, to sort of control the uh, oil price, blaming oil companies for price gauging and all that stuff. Like what are some of the other themes you're, you're following out there these days? So we also run an energy portfolio on top of the mining portfolio, and we've done that for a couple of years. Um, the energy portfolio that we oversee this year is up over 100%. So selfishly, you know, in July, I started to take a lot of money off the table because we started to, you know, try to preserve our gain for the year, right? So I'm, I'm very heavy cash and energy right now. We've seen a pullback in uh, oil prices a bit and, and a significant pullback in natural gas here over the last few weeks as you know, China's production has increased, uh, there's some Russian activity, you know, all these things are leading to slow, you know, lower gas prices. But then again, what's happening, right? We're entering the winter, so gas prices will probably be fine. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the energy trade is very interesting. There's a lot of ways to play it. We will play it through MLPs, through gas stocks. We've been playing it through fuel cell stocks. Um, we haven't chased a lot of the Momo kind of stuff in energy. Um, because the prices are just too high for me as a value investor, but we have them on our radar and we're tracking that. Um, so I think energy is going to be really interesting as we enter next year. Um, we also think that um, if you look at, we put out a piece about, hmm, I think a month or two ago on a palladium and platinum as they were trading really poorly and uh, clearly getting shorted into oblivion. So those tickers are P-A-L-L -L and P-P-L-T to track the price of palladium and, and platinum respectively. And uh, you're seeing it again the last uh, three days. You know, the, the shorts are back, uh, driving these things to support levels. Um, and there was some negative news on platinum just yesterday in terms of oversupply. So we don't own any platinum stocks here um, really at all. Um, we still own some palladium stocks because I wrote on palladium for Sprott. I know the dynamics there very well. Things snap back way faster than people expect because if you get a supply disruption, like if you have a strike in South Africa, a big mining company that mines for palladium, then supply falls off a cliff, and and um, it's it's probably going to happen again at some point in 2022. Yeah. Um, I've, I've titled the video "How to Avoid Some Investment Traps and Gold and Silver Investment Traps." Um, maybe to wrap up uh, our conversation as well, like how can we avoid them and how should we play the rest of the year, maybe the first month into the new year as well, till we see some themes uh, play out. Uh, how do we avoid those traps, like the head fakes we've seen a couple of days or the last few weeks? How do we avoid them? Any any last tips there? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things we do is we silver is one of our top five holdings, right? I've got every incentive to tell your listeners, let's go out and buy SLV or PSLV. I don't do that. If you look at my history on podcasts for the last two years, I've been saying we've got to get through this support level or the, this resistance level, meaning like 25 here right now, then 28, then 30. Like until we do that, don't talk to me about how silver is going to 80 or 100 or 200 like some of these guys do. It's just, you know, where are you coming from? Like, you know, it's not constructive to the average client to hear this because when they don't see that, right, Kai, they get derailed, they get pissed off, they sell their stocks, and it's just not, you know, it's not doing any anyone any good. So um, what I would suggest is what I said on your show earlier, set your stink bids away from the action. So if a stock's trading at 50 cents, set it out there at, you know, 0 0.4501 and just see if you get filled or 0 0.4401 and just see what happens, you know. You get these weird spikes at the beginning and end of, of trading days especially at the beginning of days, I find in junior mining stocks where people are like, let's say you're entering a holiday like today, right? You just want to get out the door, get out the door a little bit earlier to your vacation. You might just put a market order in as, as, as a financial advisor and, you know, not knowing that there's no bids out there on a light volume day. And, and if you're out there prepared and ready for that, you're going to get filled. So we, we chip away at some of our favorite names and we encourage people with dollar cost average in a time like this. No, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, do you have a couple names you're playing right now? I know you always uh, follow a couple of certain names. Uh, be curious to see what, what you're playing these days. 
So in the gold space, U.S. Gold, which is USAU, I mentioned that on your program before, they just came out today with news that they're going to have an announcement December 1st. I have no idea what that is, but when you see a company put out something pre-announcement you know, like that, I, I would imagine it's what they've been telegraphing, which is that they have news on their Copper King uh, CK Gold asset coming by end of year. So I think that's going to come sooner than, than expected. Um, and um, we're prepared for that. You know, It's a top five holding for us in full disclosure. Um, Idaho Champion, I talked to the CEO this morning. They had some tax loss selling, uh, big tax loss selling at Desjardins yesterday. Um, and we were buying again out there, you know, the, the bid act, bid was 0 0.062. We're out there at 0 0.053, right? Like way away percentage wise. And we're getting filled because someone put a huge order out there. So um, that ticker is GLDRF. But they have two 100% owned uh, Idaho properties with you know two great advisors they brought on this year, um, and then also have cobalt you know properties as well. Um, so that's gold, silver. We like you know gold and minerals again here. It's just getting crushed. Um, AUMN is is the ticker. It's at 40 and a half cents. Um, we've been in and out of that stock, but mostly in for the last few years, as you know. Um, and um, they will probably announce that they're going to go into production at Bellardania next year, which is big news for them. They'll share the mill with their existing mine they're producing from Rodeo. Um, in silver space, if you want a flyer in terms of the near term price action, I would say aftermath because you've seen that Peruvian news this week. Um, and anything in Peru is getting a haircut here. So that ticker is AAGFF. Um, their projects are in Chile and Peru. However, all of them, three of them, are at seven, economic at seventeen fifty an ounce silver. So we look for that kind of de-risked, you know, opportunity, and maybe not the best jurisdiction right now. But you know, I think Castillo will eventually move more towards the center, and some of this, you know, headline risk will go away. Fantastic, John. This was great catching up with you again. Thanks for making the time before the long weekend. Really appreciate sure. it. Um, Great, great investment ideas, themes as well. So definitely avoid those investment traps and f just follow. Like there, there are lots of good opportunities and ideas out there. You, you mentioned a few as well. So appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the program. Yep. Of course, guy. Fantastic. Thank you. Everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. This was SF Live episode 222. We were joined by John Fennec of Fennec Consulting. I think it's FennecConsulting.com for, for more details. John, I'm right? Yes. Fantastic. And um, make, make sure to follow him there. Uh, all his services and ideas are on the website as well. And uh, make sure to follow us. Leave a link, leave a like, uh, leave a like, leave a comment, uh, leave a thumbs up, uh, turn on the bell notification, all the good stuff. Happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the long weekend. Thanks for joining us here. And we'll be back next week with a lot more, even in-person interviews here from Vancouver.